no sound, not looking. I felt what I felt here, but I felt it right here, and it was like as big as both hands. And it was just going up toward the TV. And so I'm writing and I feel it. Now, I don't feel stuff a lot, okay? I never cared to. I told God, I don't care what I feel. I don't care if I see anything. I want to operate in pure faith. And if that's necessary for me not to see anything or feel anything, so be it, because that would be greater faith. So, but I started feeling some stuff. So it's going toward the television. So I'm writing, I stop and look up. Right when I look up, there's a young boy on this video that has this huge tumor. It's a, it's a cancer tumor outside of his body. And right when I looked up, it went and just bleh. I mean, it's gross, all right? And this goo was all over me. It was, just, it was really gross. And I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, what is this? You know, and so I just, I just have a habit of just stopping and going, Lord, what is that? Have you ever noticed Jesus never answered a question except with another question? Isn't that right? And that's exactly what he did. So I said, what is that? And the first thing he said was, what, happen, have, have, what happens whenever... Well, first off, he said, have you ever been involved in a life-threatening situation? Well, yeah. A lot of times. He said, what happens when you start talking about it? And I said, well, if I talk about it, the, the more detailed I get, the more I relive it. And if I get detailed enough and really start to relive it, my heartbeat will speed up, my, my breathing will get shallow, and my blood pressure can go up. And, and now it's not actually happening. I'm just reliving it. Right? And he's, that's when he stopped. And he said, that's what's happening. I thought, what is that? Because I had nothing to do. I didn't know that kid. I didn't know that he, it wasn't one of my healing services. It was another whole thing. This is what he told me. He said, the Spirit of God is remembering when he healed that boy. But I felt it. Why? Then I said, God, you got to give me scripture. I want scripture for that. This is weird. I want scripture. He quoted a scripture to me I have preached on many times. But I always emphasized one part. I, I emphasized the last part. He emphasized the first part. He said, If that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. Right? I always preached on him quickening your mortal body. He emphasized the first part. And he said it over and over again. He said, if that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Stop. Zzz, right back. If that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Zzz, right. I mean, just over and over. And finally I got it. The same spirit that healed that boy is the same spirit that's in me. Even though I wasn't there. Then it started getting me. Well, wait a minute. The, what he's quoting me is that the spirit that's in me raised Jesus from the dead. Then I started realizing, ha, has any human ever healed the sick? No. We talk about Wigglesworth, this. We talk about John Lake doing this. No, no, no. It wasn't any of them. It was always the spirit. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in Wigglesworth did it. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in John Lake healed the people. Isn't that right? And then I started realizing, because I've always had, people always tell me stuff like, well, you know, I just don't know what to do, and I've never been in that situation. That's okay. He has. Matter of fact, he's been in every situation. There has never been a healing that he didn't do. There's never been a situation that he wasn't in. Do you, under, do you get what I'm saying? The spirit that's in you has done every healing, every dead raising, everything that's ever happened miraculous, the Spirit in you did it. And, the, and you're worried about being ready. <clears throat> As if you could actually do it. You understand? And when I realized that, I realized, you know what? There ain't nothing I can walk into that we can't beat. Because he's been, I don't know what's going on, he does. And he will, he, he will take care of the situation. So quit trying to get ready. Quit trying to become. And just be. 
who Christ made you to be. He's not, he's not adding to you. He's not, he, you are. You're not a, remember, you're not a new evolution. You didn't evolve into the Christian God wants you to be. You're a new creation. You were created in the Spirit who God wanted you to be. You were, you were created perfect and complete in Him. Amen? It doesn't say you're completely in Him. It says you are complete in Him. If it said you're completely in Him, that just means you're all in Him. But when it says you're complete in Him, that means there ain't nothing in you lacking anything that He expects you to do. You get it? That's who you are. Now, back to the paraclete thing. We were in South Bend, Indiana. And I was up there with Dr. Lester Summerall. In South Bend, Indiana, there's card uh, manufacturing plants. There's a couple of them. One is a Studebaker, which is out of business. And the other was a, an Avante. And the Avante is an amazing car, right? You can take one wheel off and it'll still drive. Literally, that's how well balanced that car was. Amazing car. But anyway, it's beside the point. <clears throat> they invited us to go to this car thing where they make cars and they had done some other stuff. But they said, want to come out and see how these are done? I said, yeah, let's go out there. So we go out and it's this huge plant, and you know, tall inside. And they got these 2,000, 3,000 pound car bodies and chassis and all that stuff sitting around. And you had these long, there wasn't anybody on the ground floor. They had these things up that looked like crane, you know, operator things. And it was a crane operator thing. <laughs> And so we had to climb all these stairs, walk across these catwalks and all that kind of stuff to get in there. We go in, there's this old guy sitting there and he's sitting back. And you tell he's been there a long time. And he knew his job, but he was sitting there and he had these like joysticks. And he was just, he wasn't even really, you know, if I was there, I'd have been like, okay, here we go. But he wasn't like that. He was just sitting back talking to us. Yeah, okay. And he just tapped that thing and that arm was out there, that crane. He'd tap it and he'd, zzz, and he'd tap it. And, zzz, and he, he would go down and he would pick up this car. And he's just talking. Zzz, move it over, put it down here, sit it down on this conveyor belt thing. It's amazing. And you know what? He just moved a car and didn't even break a sweat. You're right? And I'm watching him and he's just tapping. I mean, it's so easy. He's not even, no, it's not even muscle. He's just kept talking, just moving cars around and all this kind of stuff. And the Spirit of God began to speak to me. And he said, you see that arm? You see that crane? You see these joystick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, and I, I started thinking about that. He said, look, the Holy Spirit is the go-between between you and the problem. The Holy Spirit, now get this, that, that man can't lift a car. But that crane, and that crane was pretty neutral. The crane really didn't care what he lifted. Right? But, that man, now get this, that man was doing the will of the company. He had matched his will to the will of the company. The company wanted cars moved, the man said, let's move some cars. He put his will with the company will. When he did, he started, when I watch this, he started maneuvering, right, with the joysticks, didn't even break a sweat. And this crane, now he can't pick up a car, but this crane did. That means that this crane, what was the purpose of the crane? To amplify and magnify the man's will. Isn't that right? Isn't that all it did? It amplified the man's will so that it could accomplish the man's will. Now the man's will was in line with the company's will. So they, the company gave him a crane to accomplish the company's will. But the crane didn't move without the man's hands moving it. That's a paraclete. That's one called alongside to help you get the job done. Amen? And no matter how big the job, no human can heal. But when God gives you the Holy Ghost to accomplish His will, the Holy Ghost can accomplish it through you. Amen? That's what I've been trying to get across to you all, all this week. In your manual, there's a couple of letters in there. One was from John Lake to Kerry Jeb Montgomery. And in it, he talks about his, the secret 
to the success he had in the miracles. And he said, our secret, the secret to our success is very simple. He said, we teach our workers to exercise the dominion of God. And we command the devil and his works to depart rather than do what the rest of the church does, which is to intercede with God to take it away. You don't find anything in the New Testament about you asking God to take anything away, to heal anybody, to do anything. He said to heal the sick. Now, you know you can't, so he gave you a spirit that can. And then, you look at all of the examples, and every time, Jesus never asked God to do it. He commanded healing. And as he commanded, his words were spirit and life. And as he spoke, the Spirit could do what needed to be done. This is what you need to know. This is why you can do what God said you can do. And the thing is, it's simple. It's easy. It's not hard. Because remember I told you, it's not what you say, it's who says it. And when a child of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees, hell hears and obeys. Amen? That's who you are. Now, one last thing will be done. It's Saturday night, right? It's what, 8.30? Saturday night. Come on. It's not late. You know, about this time, 20 years ago, you were getting ready to go to the nightclub. <laughs> right? You didn't even get out there and get started until 9 or 10 o'clock. Right? And you give all your good years to the devil. And then when you can't get out there and shake like you used to, then you decide to give your life the rest of your years to God. <laughs> right? You used to go out there and party till 2 o'clock, then go find something that's open and eat till 3. Maybe get home, take a shower, jump in bed, wake up at about 6 or 7 and do it all over again. Right? Hopefully you didn't jump up and go to church. Okay? You hypocrite? No, okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> And then, and the funny thing is, you do that for years and years, and then you get to church, and by 8.30, you're looking to, oh, man, I wish that preacher would shut up. I'm tired. <sighs> Come on. We talk about the 24-hour revival, and everybody gets excited until I say, all right, tonight it's going to start. That's right. And everybody's like, oh, not, not tonight. <sighs> but when you think, it, you think it's going to happen on your schedule? Ain't going to happen on your schedule, right? you got to develop some endurance. Right? Remember when you left, if you were in Paul's meeting and you left early, you didn't see the guy fall out of the balcony and die and get raised up. So you don't want to leave early, you might miss a dead raising. <laughs> Amen? And apparently Paul was pretty boring. The guy fell asleep listening to him. Right? So I, I, I'm, in, I'm in good company. The Bible says that Paul preached deep into the night. Right? So I'm, I'm trying to be like Paul. Amen? So we'll see what, no, I'm just kidding. Don't get worried. Don't get worried. Okay? <laughs> Don't even, don't even try to get out. We've already locked the door. <laughs> no, no, I can't. Now, years ago, after I had had this Sudafed experience, okay, we, we call it the Sudafed anointing, right? A couple of years after that, I told that story, and I was in Denver, and I, I, some people came and picked me up, take me to the church, and I rode up in the front passenger side. When I opened the door, I, I was looking out to, to get out, looking down, and there was a box of Sudafed in the doorway. And I looked down and the lady saw me see it and she goes, we're just trying to be anointed like you, Brother Curry. <laughs> what are you going to say after that, right? <laughs> so, I told him, I said, you know, if I could be just a little, just a little more TBN-ish, I'd have a stack of Sudafed boxes on the table and I could sell you the anointing for $9.95. Okay? okay, anyway. <laughs> now, a couple of years after that, Actually, I, yeah, right around that time. I heard about this Pensacola revival. So I wanted to go down there and see what was going on. So we'd pack up all of our kids and all our kids' friends and all that. And everywhere we went, it was like taking an army with us. And so we all go down there. And there's this long line out the front door. So we're standing there waiting to see what's going on. You know, we want to get in line to get in. You've got to get there. There were people standing there at 4 o'clock in the morning to get in to the 7 o'clock service that night. All right? Standing in line. I mean, and it was worth it. You know, I didn't get there at 4, but... We got there a little bit later on. Well, we're standing there, and this guy comes out and says, Are there any, any ministers? Any ministers? I'm like, 
Yeah, and he goes, well, come on, you don't have to stand in line. We'll put you up here. I'm like, yeah, all right. Good to be noticed, you know. So we go on inside, and they go, we got a special section for you right down front. So they sit us down in this little section. It's all the ministers, me and my wife, and the kids are down. So we're all sitting there, and the music starts, and it's good, you know. Now, one of the reasons when I went down there is, okay, I was raised Southern Baptist, predominantly. My dad was a policeman, and then I went in the military, right? Now, none of those things... In try to promote you to use much emotion, right? As a Southern Baptist, not much emotion, not, not where I went. As a son of a police officer, everything, not much emotion, right? In the military, not much emotion, just do your job, right? I tell everybody, you know, when I was in the Baptist church, our standard position was like this. That was it. You know, that's the way you did. If you did anything more than that, they didn't like it. So it's pretty much like this. Then I went in the Air Force, and my position changed to this. And that was the difference between the Southern Baptist and U.S. Air Force. Right? That was the difference right there. That was the difference. That was it. All right? Same emotion, everything else. Now, but I had been in the nightclubs. Remember I told you about the Saturday Night Fever days? Right? So my thing was dancing. Now, I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I never done dr- I've never tasted alcohol. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never done drugs. All right? Now, before you think I was goody-goody and all holy, okay? All the other sins, I did. It was just those three that I didn't. Okay? Mainly because whenever I sinned, I wanted to remember it. I didn't want to be out of my head. All right? So I want to remember everything. So... So I went, I used to go dancing at the nightclub, and I ended up making a car commercial for Subaru uh, dancing, and they come out and did, did the dancing, and then they, we drove, you know, we come out, and we're like, I expect perfection in my partner when I dance, and when I drive, I expect perfection. That's why I drive a Subaru Brat. Okay, the Subaru Brat is far from perfection in driving, amen? But they paid good. So we drove, we drove this car around, and they filmed it, and they put on, it was a car commercial. So dancing was the one thing I did. Now, whenever I'd first got married, and my wife and I, we heard about this movie, Saturday Night Fever. I had never been, I had never, I think I was, what, 20, 21, something? I had never been in a nightclub. I'd been in bars to play pool, but I'd never been in a nightclub to go dancing. I'd never been dancing. So we went and watched this movie, Saturday Night Fever. I got possessed. I, okay, I'm not exaggerating. I'm, I was demon-possessed. I had never been dancing. We went and watched that movie. Later that, that was like on a Wednesday or something. By Friday night, I was in a nightclub and I knew all the dances. I never learned them. I just knew them. Within about a month, I was teaching dancing at the nightclub. All right? That's called a satanic anointing. All right? I knew it. You watch some guitar players playing music, playing rock, they'll move their hand and the guitar keeps playing. Okay? That's a satanic anointing. It happens. Now, so I'm, I'm, now remember, this is back like 78, 77, 78, right through there. So, I, the dancing was my big thing. And so I'm out there dancing, doing stuff. Well, whenever I gave all that up, started going to church. And I went to a charismatic church, so they were pretty lively, and there was, you know, all the stuff going on. And, but I was always kind of leery, because I was sure that if I ever just let go and worship God and started dancing in the Spirit, I was going to start all of a sudden. And that, and that scared me because I just knew if I let go, you know, the, the Spirit of John Travolta was going to come on me, right? And I didn't want that happening in church. So the, the best I could do was kind of the chained elephant dance, you know, where you go from one leg to the other, you know, never more than one foot off the ground at a time, you know, and it's kind of like, and just, you know, charismatic calisthenics, you know what I'm talking about, yeah, that kind of, so we go down to Pensacola, and so I'm down there, and I'm thinking, all right, God, I'm here to see what's going on, but I want freedom, I ought to be able to worship you in, in dance, I ought to be able to worship you, and not have this bondage of not being able to do that. I ought to be able to worship you with my body. Amen? That's what I was thinking. So I get down there and music starts and it's good. And I'm like, bless God, time for me to get free. Well, okay, I had the foolish idea that you could get free in private. Right? You can't get free in private. Especially if it's something like that. Right? Worship, right? So I tell my wife, I'm going to go back over here. She goes, where are you going? I'm going to go back over here. Just back toward the back. 
So I go back to the back, it's packed. So then I go outside and go to the overflow building, which is really where all the kids are. And so I walk in, and man, the music's going, and the balcony's doing this. I mean, because they're up there bouncing and jumping around. And I'm like, okay, and it's loud. I'm thinking, if I can't get free here, I can't get free anywhere. <laughs> so I get in there, and I, I get up underneath that balcony. It's dark. And I'm thinking, nobody will see me. It'll be good. I can get free here, all right? Like I said, you can't get free in private, right? So I'm back there against the wall, and I'm like, all right, Father. I need freedom. I thank you for it. Now, Wigglesworth said, I may start in the flesh, but I end in the spirit. So I'm just going to take off and just kind of start dancing, worshiping God, and expect to be made free. So I started, and pretty soon, man, I'm crying, worshiping. I'm crying. Oh, God, look. And just dancing. I'm talking tears, snot. Oh, God. You know, just going. Right? And then about about the time I really feel like I broke through, I opened my eyes. I didn't know they had a camera. And they had this huge screen. And I'm back there and I open my it's like I mean, it's that deer caught in the headlight look, you know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden it's like because I'm i I'm kinda out in the light now, so I just want to kind of fade off in the darkness. So I sneak out the door and come back across, go back in, come back in, sit down by my wife. I'm like, okay, I'm back. I just mentioned because we know where you were. There's a screen right there. So, so I thought, yeah, boy. Pride goes before a fall. Isn't that right? So that's what I'm saying. You can't get free in private, okay? Your freedom comes in public, okay? So we start to leave. The service is over. Everything's good. I start to leave. As I walk out, I watch these four, there's these four tapes, videotapes there. So I, there's a, a title on them called Faith to Raise the Dead. And I thought, whoa, that, now that's a title. I had no idea. Who's this David Hogan guy? I didn't know anything about him. I thought, I don't know. If he's got Faith to Raise the Dead, I want to know about him. And so I buy these four tapes. and they were like 75 bucks or something like that at the time. So I go home. I get busy, put the tapes up on the, on the VCR show. Don't watch them for like a month. Then finally, one day I'm walking past them. I'm like, man, I hadn't seen those tapes yet. So I pull them off, stick them in, and there's four of them. Each one's about an hour and a half, two hours long. So I start watching it, and I sit down in the chair, and I mean, I'm what this guy's a wild man, okay? I mean, and he is mean. I, you think I'm mean. <laughs> He's mean, okay? And he had all these little sayings and little things, and I'm watching, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I just sit there and cry. And my, I, I went through those four tapes. I sit there for like two weeks straight almost. I mean, I really don't even remember getting up. I know I did, but I don't remember it. And I watched it, and I wore them out, watched them over and over and over again. And he didn't do any healing. He didn't do any, anything. He just preached and told testimonies of what was going on in his work down in Mexico. And I'm watching this, and my wife said, What is wrong with you? You've never been like, what is wrong? I've never seen you like this. You just sit there, watch these tapes, and cry. And I said, This man is living the life I've been preaching about. I said, I'm tired of preaching it. I want to live it. I want it to be alive in me. I want it to be real like it is in his life. So by this time, I'd already collected a whole bunch of other tapes on A.A. Allen, videotapes, healing services, Allen, Coe, all these people. Jack Coe, big man, wild man. He was something. His son was my pastor at one time. I think it's Sudafed. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he's a big old guy, right? And he has this deep voice. And you watch him. And he would preach a little bit, and then they would bring out the sick. And he, this little woman came out one time, and he said, little elderly, you know, like a little school teacher and the bun in her hair, and a little Pentecostal woman. And he walks up, and back then they had these big old microphones, you know, back in the 50s. And he's like, oh, Mama, what's wrong with you? Just big old booming voice. And she's like, well, uh, well, I got a back problem. I, just back, I got some problems with my back. He goes, all right. Puts the microphone up. Steps over behind her. Never let a healing evangelist get behind you. All right? Because <clears throat> they don't know, you don't know what they're doing. All of a sudden, he grabs her by the head. And steps beside her, which turns her head sideways toward the camera. She's got back problems. He grabs her, turns her head, and goes, down, up, down, up, down, up. And every time, now, 
she's got back problems. She goes down every time she comes up, her, his hands are like this, and she's like... I mean, just the fear on her face. Okay? And he goes back and forth, and finally he pulls her up and turns her loose, and she's like... And he takes that microphone, and he goes, how's that? And she goes, I'm healed. I thought so. And then she just kind of walks off. You know, just dazed. You know? And so I'm watching this, right? And, I'm, and I didn't listen to their preaching a whole lot, but I'm watching how he ministers. And then I watch Alan. A. A. Allen was an amazing man. All right? A. A. Allen, that was his initials. His real name was Asa Alonzo Allen. His name was A. A. Allen. And he was, a, he was a small little guy. He was kind of like Groucho Marx, you know, as a Christian without the mustache. And he would step out. He had a song leader. <clears throat> he, well, he had two of them, but one of them either left or died. I don't know what happened to him because he was pretty elderly. But then he had this, this guy named Bob wanted to, he wanted to work with Alan. So he tried to get a job, but he couldn't do anything. And they said, well, we have an opening as a song leader. And they said, can you sing? He said, yes. Okay? He lied. He cannot sing at all. All right? But he lied to get the job. So he got the job, and then he would lead the worship. It was sad. But then he would say, now here's your man of faith and power for the hour, your evangelist, A.A. A. Allen. And then he would put the microphone and he'd step out of the way, and Allen had his Bible under his